All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Esther, Esther chapter 1, again. Esther chapter 1, we're going to try to finish this chapter tonight, and I don't think we're going to jump into chapter 2, we might bite off more than we can chew in a reasonable time tonight, but Esther chapter 1, we read through verse 18. King Ahasuerus ordered the queen, Vashti, to come before him so he could show her off for all of the men and the princes of his kingdom at his feast. And they'd been drinking, but she refused. And her refusal, her denial, (coughs) was uh, feared to maybe cause... Uh, a similar reaction to all the women throughout the kingdom. Once it was known that the queen refused to come at the king's command, then maybe all the men's wives throughout the 127 provinces would no longer respect their husbands. So what should be done for something like that? Let's begin and read verses 19 through 22, and then we'll go back and make a few remarks. Verse 19, Memucan, one of his advisors, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people." Verse 19 gives us a famous expression, the laws of the Persians and the Medes. Sometimes it's reversed, the laws of the Medes and Persians. Uh, Any oral command had the uh, possibility of being reversed and changed. But if it was given and written and then sealed with the king's signet or his ring, then it became unalterable, irreversible. I want you to look uh, forward to the book of Daniel, a similar item in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, and let's read there verses 8, 8 through 12. Daniel 6, verses 8 through 12. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Didn't matter to him. That's a marvelous thing. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Of course, the king regretted it later on when he discovered it would mean Daniel being tossed into the lion's den. But the same debate uh, between oral agreements and written commands still rages. Um, A judge will have to dismiss any claim or reject any claim or testimony based solely on hearsay or uh, uh, an oral or, or verbal agreement. He said, she said, 
uh, the, the judge, he or she, if you watch these judge programs, uh, can only rule on what has been agreed upon in writing, where the two parties at once at one time agreed to stand by what was in writing. Uh, people who, who say they are originalists uh, or strict constructionists in the United States care what the U.S. Constitution actually says. And I would be one of them. And I think most of you would be in that crowd. Not what some liberal or some homo thinks it should have said or should have meant. We care. And here at Bible Baptist Church International, I don't want to know what the Bible means, and I don't want to know what the Bible teaches. The first thing I want to know is, what does the Bible actually say? If we can agree on what the Bible actually says, then the right teaching should follow without much trouble after that. Um, people who resent that keep trying to rewrite the Bible so that they can end up with a book uh, that when it's read, it says what they want it to say anyway. And uh, I, think I, I think I said this not long ago. The word Bible conveys a certain measure of authority. That's the standard. That's the rule on any given subject. You know, the auto mechanics Bible, the fisherman's Bible, all these authors keep adding the word Bible to the rest of their title because that has a, a ring of authority to it. And so it used to be the King James Bible or the Holy Bible. And then over here, you'd have the New American Standard Version or the New International Version. Now, the publishers have switched the language and tried to play mental games with the public and the uh, buying public and say, the New International Bible, the New American Standard Bible, and over here, the King James Version. See how they switch the language on the general public? But uh, I'm interested in what the Bible actually says, not what someone thinks it's supposed to mean or what someone thinks it said. Verse uh, 19 also says, Let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Well, David certainly was better than King Saul when the kingdom came to him. And that's a type of a Gentile church age ultimately being replaced with the Jewish bride once again in the millennium following the great tribulation. But God had done you know, just the opposite at the beginning of the church age. In fact, go forward to the book of Matthew, chapter 21. Matthew, chapter 21. Matthew 21. And let me start there with uh, verse 41, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priest and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Yes, he did. Go forward, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 13. Acts, chapter 13, and... Verse 45, verses 45 and 46. Acts 13, verses 45 and 46. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, Jews, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Go forward to chapter 18, Acts 18. 
Acts 18 and verse 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And also Acts 28. Acts 28 and verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. So, in type, Vashti, who is going to be replaced with Esther as the story unfolds, is a preview, a foreshadow, of this Gentile age being replaced with, a, with the uh, age of the uh, nation of Israel being the prominent nation of the Lord Jesus Christ under their Messiah come the millennial kingdom. But God had reversed it on them when they by and large rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and so he took the offering uh, offer from them and said whosoever will may come and the gospel was is now preached to both Jew and Gentile. Um, right now, every Jew is just like every Gentile. All are sinners under the judgment of God. The Bible says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Romans 3, verse 9. And let's read Esther 1, verse uh, 22 again. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. I was looking through uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary, which I have at home, just before we came over, and other commentators tend to do the same thing. They take sides with Vashti and criticize the counsel of the king's princes and advisors. And Jameson Fawcett Brown said the advice to the king was to flatter, in effect, flatter the king and to initiate. Um, universal um, enslavement of women. But commentaries and commentators' opinions aside, Memekin's counsel actually amounts to New Testament doctrine. Let me, not the enslavement of women. Go forward, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Bible stands in the way of so many people with so many desires in the world. It stands in the way of homos, same-sex crowd. It stands in the way of uh, women's lib. It stands in the way of wholesale integration and race mixing. It really does. Do you realize the 12 tribes of Israel in the end of the book of Numbers all 12 tribes were to not even intermarry between tribes. They were to keep eat their own tribes and their inheritance separate from one another. Now, there is a, a multitude of grace in the New Testament, so there are no hard and fast rules against uh, mixed marriages, put it that way. And you and I all have dear friends or maybe relatives who represent mixed marriages or mixed couples. And if they are saved, that's even better. They love the Lord and they want to please the Lord. And there are no hard and fast rules. But uh, as a general principle, God divided the nations for his own pleasure. And uh, we used to say, well, they used to say in marriages, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Well, what if you reverse that and say what God has divided, maybe you shouldn't be joining them together. Like I say, there are a lot of, there's a lot of grace in the New Testament. There are no 
hard and fast rules um, imposed on the believer. But as a matter of practical sense in the world we live in, that's probably the best course of action. Now, if, you've, if that's no longer able to apply to you, that's fine. You depend on the grace of God to get you through all kinds of problems, all kinds of um, obstacles. I was, and I'm not trying to uh, go down a rabbit trail and harp on the on that particular subject. We've been married 35 years, and on our on our 24th wedding anniversary, I went to work that day, and uh, I ran into a young lady at a hospital and the subject that it was our wedding anniversary came up and she said well I want to get married too and I don't want to make any mistake what advice would you give to somebody like me and no one had ever asked me that and I said well and I told her she was the first one who would ever ask my opinion on that I said I guess I would say find somebody who is as much like you as possible as much like you as you possibly can because you're going to eliminate future hurdles to be hurt, uh, leaping over. You'll lem- eliminate as many obstacles beforehand that you won't have to leap over later on. And, um, and I said, if si- someone who is as much like you, whatever your religious belief is, find someone who shares that same religious belief. Whatever your political party is, find someone who shares the same political party. Don't Republicans and Democrats shouldn't be getting married to each other. That's that's hell on wheels, your baby. You're, you're asking for trouble. A Republican, marry another Republican. Democrat, just don't get married. Just stay home. We have a, there are enough of you already. And I said, and don't and don't feel intimidated if you say I think I would prefer to marry someone of the same racial racial group as me. I think she was. Uh, uh, Latina, Hispanic girl. And she says, I know that's not politically correct, but it makes good sense. I said, well, I think it does. All right. But um, so Memukin's advice wasn't to subjugate women and make them uh, in slaves, enslave them throughout the kingdom. But uh, look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Go forward to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And then also go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 2 says, A bishop then must, verse 4, Uh, be one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Down at verse 12 also, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. If a man doesn't run his home, he'll wreck it. You know, um, if a a husband and a wife, father and mother, have a a very loving rapport and relationship with one another. Then, by example, in the in the most ideal set of circumstances, by example, the young man should watch his dad treat his mom carefully and tenderly, and then uh, parents have a right to expect him to treat some young lady that way. And a daughter sees how her mother is treated and she should not settle for anything less than the way her dad treated her mom. She should hold on to she can find some young man who will treat her with just as much grace and uh, tenderness. So 
but a man can ruin it all. if He's not on the ball paying attention. And um, oh, everyone else has their faults too. But God's going to hold the man accountable as the head of the home. He, he says he's to be the head of the home, the head of the wife. And uh, particularly those running a, a church, pastors, bishops, uh, deacons, are to be uh, the heads of their home, having their children, their wives in subjection. I'm very fortunate that my wife uh, has a good relationship with the Lord uh, on her own and doesn't require me to say it's time for our Bible class, time for our Bible study. I've, know, I've known some men and they think, now when children are young, I think it's good, a good example for a dad and mom to read the Bible and pray with their little children, teach them how to love the Bible for themselves because one day you can't be reading their Bible for them. One day you can't be doing their praying for them. Teach them how to do those things and why those things are important as believers. But uh, I'm glad that, and so some men, friends of mine, they think that uh, they have to have church with their wife and two children when their children are in their mid to late teens. And they're right at that age where you know, dad's breathing down their neck and they're, they're miserable and they don't want to, you know, there's that little bit of rebellious streak in them. And uh, to force them to sit down and listen to dad uh, teach or listen, you might be, you might have the reverse uh, effect that you're trying to have. You, you may drive them farther away from wanting to be close to God and live close to the Lord. Uh, you live close to the Lord. Let them see you living close to the Lord. Let them see you reading your Bible and spending time talking to God. John Wesley would say that his mother uh, hung a red scarf on the outside of her bedroom door every day. And uh, for about an hour, she was alone in the bedroom praying to God. And the children knew they were to be quiet until that scarf was taken off and mother came out again. And... Uh, so, but the advice Membiken gave was not to enslave women. Um, as in the end, it actually matches what God had commanded the woman and the man, or the woman, in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall rule over thee. And you know, there are three universal decrees in the book of Esther, of the Persians and the Medes, I'll tell you what they are before we finish for tonight. Um, there's the first one here in Esther 1, verse 22, for men to be the rulers of their own homes and to send to 127 provinces from Ethiopia all the way to India, as the book uh, outlines for us. That was a large swath of the Middle East and the territory of the world at that time. The second decree will be found when we get to chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, sent out through all the kingdom to kill the Jews. And then the third one will be sent out through all the kingdom, um, trying to undo the second one, for the Jews to defend themselves. And those are the three <clears throat> universal decrees sent out throughout all the provinces of the Persian Empire. But when you see the, the word which cannot be altered, in a sense, that's also a type of the word of God. As a Bible believer, I believe the copy of the words of God I'm reading right now, that this book, these words are the words of God. These have been arranged and organized by his providence and put in my hands because these are the words, this is the vocabulary he wants me to read. These are the words he wants me to see and on the page, read, to memorize, to know, uh, and to compare so that I know what God's word says. And uh, it alters not. And uh, Christ said, 
heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And uh, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So I don't doubt that when we get to heaven, you and I are going to see a copy of the Bible. And the Bible that we should have yielded ourselves to, the Bible we should have believed from cover to cover and had given heed to, because it's not just here to sit in our coffee tables and to uh, match our shoes or match your, your ladies' purses on Sunday mornings. The Bible is here because these are the words of God he wants us to read and is going to hold us to account for one day. To whom much is given of the same shall be much required. And every day you and I have a Bible and we're able to think and reason and read it, then uh, that's one more day God has a right to ask us to give account for.